Right, good morning everybody and thank you for attending today's uh, webinar on returning to work safely. My name is Rich Olson and, and I will uh, walk you through the brief introduction um, to the services that we offer and then I'll pass you over to our guest speakers which are Nick Riley, Kate Goodman and Martin John today. So um, we are a um, advisory service providing free support to businesses um, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, it's been fully funded by the um, Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority um, and the Business Board. We have local partnerships with the Cambridge Chambers of Commerce, the Federation of Small Businesses, the IOD and Make UK, plus all other local councils as well. Um, as I said, this is a free service. Um, we have a team providing expert advice um, across a variety of sectors, including HR, mental health, uh, marketing, import exports, um, Health, um, health and safety, supply chain, IP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've been running a series of webinars uh, over the last few weeks around human resources, layoff um, versus furlough, uh, accessing finance, marketing, crisis communication, importing and exporting, working from home. Uh, and this is the ninth in our series. And we have another one next Thursday on operating. Um, efficiency and how to improve your operating efficiency in the post-COVID world and um, then we have a final two which we will be delivering over the course of the following two weeks. Um, as I said these are free webinars um, all uh, businesses within the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Greater Left Area are able to obtain free business support as well. So my name is Rich Olson I will now pass over to Nick Riley who will take us through the first part of the presentation. Thanks, Rich. So I'm going to talk about the, um, the health and safety aspects of returning to work. Um, it's nice to be talking about returning to work and more positive theme. There are some issues that everybody needs to take care of. So duty of care is part of the Health and Safety at Work Act. So the key line within this is that employers must do everything that's reasonably practicable to keep their staff safe. So in real terms, what you have to do is produce a risk assessment that specifically addresses the risk of COVID-19. And if you look from the, the health and safety executive guidance on it, part of that process must include a consultation. So whatever you come up with as the risks and your proposed mitigation measures, you need to speak to your staff and listen to their feedback about their concerns and what's going to make them feel safe. And there's some links there that give you good guidance on it. Key thing, publish it and communicate it. Now, once you start looking at the risks, it's important that the last things you consider are PPE and behavior control. So try and use a hierarchy, here's an example of one here. The most important aspect is you eliminate as many risks as you can. If you can't eliminate them, reduce them. If you can't reduce them, try and isolate where that risk or who's exposed to the risk. And then the final points are the behavior control and the PPE. If you move on, Rich. So there are lots of areas to consider, and this is a little bit like a can of worms when you actually get into it. So I'm going to talk to them, talk to you about them generically, and Martin will talk later, later more specifically about a manufacturing environment. Move on. So the first point is try not to return to work almost. By default, people should work from home. Don't put them in harm's way if you don't have to. So Within that, think about people visiting the office to do specific things that have to be done in that environment. Maybe it's, a, it's meeting someone or picking up something or getting things printed, but minimize that duration on site. Try and make sure that people aren't overlapping in any way. Move on. When you arrive at the office for the first time, potentially since lockdown, it needs to be clear to people that this is different. It's not back to business as usual. You're not going to use the office the way you used to use it. So put as much signage as possible in place to make people aware this is different. And then the most important thing you can do to minimize your risk is stop people with symptoms coming into your building. So try and create a health screen. It's difficult. The expensive blue ribbon solution is to put in place some sort of infrared scanning with turnstiles, but that's going to cost you anywhere between eight and 20,000 pounds. So that's not practical for many businesses. 
you may have some sort of self-screening. You can't actually use temperature control with these spot thermometers because that has to be done within five centimeters. So it's quite a tricky point, but it needs to be thought through and you maybe need someone sitting on a desk behind a screen checking. Move on. Any building has got lots of touch points as you go through it. So from the front door and all the way through, an easy answer would be to leave all those doors open but you can't neglect all the other risks that were in place before. So fire safety is a big one and you can't just open fire doors and leave them around. So some doors will necessar necess necessarily remain closed. So you have to think about what the, the cleaning regime is for that. Anywhere there's a touch point in your building as you go through, you need some sort of cleaning regime and sanitizer points. So that needs to be thought through. Move on. Toilets are really tricky. Even if it's a single cubicle, if it's a larger toilet, the entry exit rules have to be really clear. We don't want people going in there and creating almost a crowd in the toilet. If you've got a larger toilet, you've got the luxury of potentially having an attendant controlling that. For smaller ones and smaller businesses, that's not practical. So some sort of indicator of when people are in there, even if it's Alexa, almost creating the whistle while you're in there type rule. But if you've got more than one cubicle or your rhinos, you have to think about isolating them. So in, in the picture there, you see three cubicles. You would potentially block one of those off. So you're not putting people side by side and breaking that two meter rule. Move on. So canteens, smoking areas even need to be thought through again. The key thing is people don't use them en masse. So it's about staggering the break. So you don't want everybody going at once try and get people to be conscious of staggering their breaks at different periods through the day if they're in work for any significant period of time. And again, back to that hierarchy of control, you can't rely on people's behavior. So make sure you put a circulation route in place in larger areas and mark that floor so people aren't accidentally overlapping. Move on. Changing and washing facilities, you're gonna need more. So again, we talked about those touch points. So you need to think through where is an actually sensible place to put additional wash points and even sanitation points throughout your building. As we're looking at how people get to work, the government's encouraging people to use cycling, to walk, and that potentially creates the need for more changing facilities. So if you've got existing facilities, how are you going to keep people spaced out within that? And if you haven't got enough or you haven't got any, you may need to put something in place for it. And again, the entry control and cleaning rules will apply. Move on. So once you've got people in work and they're in that working environment, you need to look at your workspace and you want to avoid this face to face scenario, whether that's where they're permanently seated or even as they pass by each other. So consider how you can redesign that. There's a booming market in Perspect screens now, but what would the lead times be for that? But aside from the workplace itself and the flow through the building, you need to think about your processes. So what are the processes happening in the office once you're back? How does that flow through the building and how do goods and even materials? How are you going to stop that face to face situation once again? Move on. So stores can be really tricky. It's an area where historically people rummage around. There's lots of touch points. So you need to reduce that. The best way to do it would be to have a manned service with some sort of screening so there isn't a lot of people going through that but for larger stores you need to make things really clear a good circulation route and think about passing points so again if people are, are going through at a different rate of knots they can pass each other by and, and don't break that social distancing rules move on for deliveries consider getting in place agreements with your suppliers, particularly your regular suppliers, about how you're gonna sign off those deliveries so there's no contact and, and maybe it's a photo or an e-signature. But also once they drop off, where are they dropping to? You need an area where you can inspect what's been dropped off and check it, it is what you've asked for and you want the drivers to, to keep their distancing rules. So again, consider some sort of marking on, on the ground outside or if it's a drop off area in the, in the reception area. Move on. So the rule for briefings and meetings is, do you have to have them and try not to? 
if you absolutely have to try and minimize the time of them so i know a house builder is doing uh inductions from home so it's, it's a video induction with a little test and then when they come to site they do an orientation which is much shorter duration and can be done outside so if you have to have the meetings outside is the best place to have them again use video and audio as much as possible and if you're thinking long term you may need to create more of these video and audio points for people inducting themselves to your building etc move on so a really tricky area is, is shared plant and equipment. You want to avoid sharing as much as possible, but that's not practical for things like photocopiers and scanners. So again, what's the hygiene regime going to be for that? Are you going to rely on the users to wipe the things down afterwards? Is that every time? Are you going to have additional cleaners? How will that work practically? And have you got any other plant which has to be shared? So think about making it easy for people to sanitize them after their use. Move on. Lifts in this lockdown position and coming back to work are only for people with mobility limitations. So you can't really have more than one person in the lift unless it's particularly large, but definitely a maximum of two because that is a confined space. So you must get the signage in place to make sure that's really clear to everybody. Move on. So we've mentioned through lots of the slides cleaning, and clearly there's a big emphasis on additional cleaning. So most people, when they've got cleaning contracts in place, their staff tend to work early in the morning and late in the evening and aren't necessarily available to provide additional services during the day. So how's your contract for that going to work? How are you going to resource that? Do you need to create some sort of in-house facility? Also, what are your supply levels? What do you need to build those up to? Where are you going to store them safely? And what what exactly you're going to use it needs to be compliant with the, with the appropriate guidance so use legitimate suppliers don't go to internet stores or anyone look at people who provide these things for a living historically move on so site emergency plans need to be reviewed things like fire drills and how are you going to keep that social distancing through that process also first aid, you might need to have some sort of um, PPE set specifically for first aiders and do they need additional training as how they're gonna handle it. Whatever you do to change your emergency response plans, you've got to communicate and update your people and consult with them, check that it's gonna work, check that it's practical and make sure it's thought through. Ideally have some drills. Move on. So RIDOR, the reporting of, of COVID-19 related issues um, has been addressed now. A few key things to note. The number one situation is an unintended incident where someone's been exposed to coronavirus. Now, for you to have created that situation, you have to have allowed COVID virus knowingly into your building. So if you're unaware of it, then it can't be a dangerous occurrence. So hopefully that won't occur. If someone's been diagnosed with it, you need to report it if there's reasonable evidence that exposure was at work. So again, if nobody's got symptoms, it's hard to imagine a scenario where that, where that will occur unless there's an outbreak of between people who've been working together and then you may need to think about it. If you're in doubt about the RIDOR aspect reporting anyway, do consult with your competent health and safety advisor, whoever that is. You have got a period of time to report it, so check that you're correct to report it and they've got all your facts straight before you do so. Move on. So just wrapping up, remember it's your duty of care. You can't rely on government or any governing bodies to do this for you. You have to do your own risk, risk assessment and consult with your workforce. Check that they are comfortable with what's been done and being done and that they will comply. And then you need to check, monitor and control what you're doing and keep records. Publish your risk assessment, keep records of the consultation and keep records of the checks you're doing to make sure that these systems are working. Move on. So here's just a few links. There are, there's lots of great information on the HSE site and the government has got some industry specific guidance as well. And I know Martin's gonna to talk to you about the, the manufacturing scenario. So that's the, that's the presentation. Back to you, Rich. And over to Kate now to take us through employing, uh, sorry, preparing employees to return. 
Right. Thanks, Rich. And thanks for that, Nick. That was really, really useful. And I think, you know, clearly there is a lot to consider uh, when you're ensuring the physical workplace is ready. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just build on Nick's points and start to think about your people. And again, I'm afraid there's quite a lot that you need to think about. Uh, so starting with before your employees even return to the workplace, one of the things you will really need to think about is putting together a resource plan. So firstly, think about the roles that you need back in the business. So which are the ones that are vital to kickstarting the business? Which ones are going to start to generate income and draw together your list of uh, the roles that you'll need back in the priority order? Then start to think about when you need them. And I think one of the things that would be very useful for you to do is to scenario plan. So you might want to think about your sales pipeline and, you know, when we get to X number of orders or X number of sales, I will bring Y number of people back into the business. And then as that increases, I will continue to grip feed people back through. But try and link that across to your sales pipeline, because, of course, if you bring people back too soon, you're just going to have to refurlough them uh, if you haven't got enough work for them to do. And in that vein, start to think about the tasks that they're going to be doing. So will they be returning to their original duties? Has your business pivoted? So are you now doing something completely different than what you were doing before? So do you need to think about new job descriptions for people? Um, or will some of the processes cha have changed? So Nick talked about having to think about working in a different way. So the processes that people follow may well have changed. So think about those tasks. And of course, how are they going to do that safely? So Nick's talked about the physical environment, but of course you now need to think about things like different start times, maybe staggering breaks, and all of those things will need to be agreed with your employees. Think about the policies that are going to need amending and creating. So this is going to affect quite a few of your employment policies. Of course, your health and safety policy will need uh, potentially updating or amending, but things like smoking policy, your absence reporting policy. So one of the things you might want to put in place is a coronavirus policy, and that's a temporary policy that's going to capture any temporary changes to all of your other ways of working. And you can review that gradually, and of course, at some point, take that back out of play. But then think about the options that are available to you. So there are a number of different things as an employer that you can do. So firstly, obviously, you've got employees that are furloughed, so you could maintain some element of furlough in the business and maybe rotate your employees, bringing people in and out as the business needs it. You may well have people that can't furlough for whatever reason. They may have uh, been employed too late to qualify for the scheme, so you might need to think about laying those people off. But you can only do that if you've got the right to do it and, of course, if you've got agreement with your employees. One of the things you might need to do is think about bringing employees back for some of the time, but not necessarily their full contracted hours. So you might want to place people onto short time working. So you will need to have a contractual right to do that or to reach agreement with your employees. Now, we know, don't we, that the furlough scheme is being extended and beyond the end of July, we will start, start to look at the ability to be able to furlough employees on a part time basis. But of course, until then, you're going to have to think about that short time working as an option. If you don't do it properly, you could be uh, in breach of contract or an employee could claim constructive dismissal. So do make sure that you're following the processes. And of course, and as Nick said, the primary piece here and will always be the preferred route will be working from home. So you could bring an employee back from furlough, but immediately have them working from, uh, the, from their home environment and really start to think about who is it you physically need to have in the business rather than working in a slightly different way. So moving on, and when you're doing that, we need to think about decision making. And I just wanted to get put to, uh, put to you just a few points that I think is absolutely worth considering. So I think the first thing is about considering both the needs of the business and the employees. So you know, you've got a reputation as an employer to consider. Um, and your employees are going to remember the decisions that you made and how you went about consulting and communicating with them. So really think about that before you make your decisions around what is it going to say about me as an employer. Make sure that you understand your cash flow. So once you start to bring people back into the business, of course, you're, uh, you won't be able to close the job retention scheme and therefore you will need to be able to pay them. 
So you really should be forecasting your cash flow requirements and thinking about how many people you can physically afford to bring back into the business uh, and thinking about when your sales income is going to start to drop back in. So think about all of the options that you've got. So plan in advance and instigate the appropriate processes for the decisions that you make. A really important one is ensuring that you comply with your legal obligations. Uh, and we will talk about some of those uh, a little later, but understanding the requirements of each of the decisions that you make and the associated risks to your business, and of course, try and mitigate those risks as much as you possibly can. You do uh, have a duty uh, not to uh, discriminate against your employees, and it's going to be quite tricky, uh, clearly, you know, directly discriminating, you know, I hope would be fairly obvious but you could fall foul of indirect discrimination so again really think about that and think about the impact of the Equality Act and then understand the mental health and well-being of your employees in each category so some employees will be very concerned um, and you need to have open and non-judgmental conversations with them you do need to think about their mental well-being and how people manage change of course they're not just coming back to work they may well be coming back to an entirely changed environment both in a physical sense but also in the roles that they may well be undertaking and also consider the experiences they may have had while they've been out of the business so it will have been a very difficult time for them they may well have been under a huge amount of pressure homeschooling or dealing with other issues they may well have lost a loved one so do think about those things when you're bringing them back into the workplace and then it, one thing that's essential for you is to keep appropriate records. So it's all well and good having those conversations with your employees, but you do need to make sure that conversations are documented. And if you do reach any agreement with your employees, you must get that in writing and you must maintain those written records for a minimum of five years. And then finally, you know, look for opportunities. There are, there are a couple of good opportunities for you right now. The first is to build your reputation as a great employer. And the way you go about doing this can really make the difference uh, about your reputation. But also, there's a real opportunity for your employees to show you what they can do. So they may be able to come back and take on new or different roles. So don't overlook that uh, opportunity to really think about where the talent is in your business. So ultimately, you make a decision to bring your employees back from furlough, uh, from the use of the job retention scheme. Now, this is absolutely new before uh, the coronavirus, we've never heard the term furlough, have we? So there is no framework in place for how to do this properly. So I'm just going to run through a few things that I think you will absolutely need to think about. And the first and most important point here is documentation. So I strongly advise that you document your approach and your decisions. So why did you choose which employees to bring back, which process to follow, uh, and really think about compliance informing your strategy. So everything you do must be fair and it must be objective. Then think about your legal considerations. We'll talk in a second about section 44 and 100 of the Employment Rights Act. Um, and I think again, that will have a significant impact on your business if you don't uh, think about your health and safety effectively. As I said, you've got a duty not to discriminate under the Equality Act, which you will need to be mindful of. And Nick's already talked about Health and Safety at Work Act and the fact that you have a duty to provide a safe workplace. Now you will need to think about the clarity of your selection process because you may not be bringing all of your employees back at once. So there are a few practical examples that I think you know, we can just touch on now as to how you might be able to inform your decision making about who to bring back when. So it may well be that you staggered furlough, so you might have furloughed some employees and then furloughed a few more a bit later on. So what you might want to do is follow that in reverse and then have a staggered return. So those that have been on furlough for longest, look to bring those back and bring those uh, others back at a later stage. You might want to think about skills and experience. So thinking about the skills and experience that you need to kickstart your business as quickly as possible and look at the employees that you've got and grade them against those skills and experience. Now you need to be able to do that fairly and robustly, um, but then you could start to bring back your most skilled employees. Uh, you could look for volunteers, but be prepared that you might get everybody volunteered to come back or you might get nobody uh, volunteer to come back. So uh, how will you manage it if you end up in that position? 
think about the relevant roles for relevant activities. So don't start bringing people back if you don't need their role in the business right now. Think about those priority areas. And as we said, you could bring people back and put them immediately on homework. So what are the roles that you could have uh, working remotely? And then finally, you could think about people's personal circumstances. So you may well have people that are in that shielding category. And from a health and safety point of view, you could uh, uh, leave your, uh, your employees that are currently shielding, and potentially have a, 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 are disabled, you could uh, potentially leave those on furlough under the basis that you are protecting them. But think about that and make sure that you avoid discriminating. Now you will need to give notice. So even if your furlough agreement says they need to come back immediately, do provide reasonable notice to your employees to do that. They might need time to sort out childcare and other arrangements. They may well have taken another role somewhere that they will need to end before they can come back to you. So do uh, treat them fairly and give them that notice period. You will need to confirm the end of furlough in writing to them. And as I said, you will need to keep that written notice for a five year period. Now we've talked about communication before, but you know, for me, this is really important to describe to your employees the measures that you've got in place, share the risk, risk assessment, talk about the PPE that's going to be available to them so that they are far more comfortable with what's going to happen when they return to the workplace and be very open. And then finally, think about your training needs. So if your business has pivoted or you've got new processes, then you may well need to train your employees to come back. It may well be that you've introduced new technology that people will need training on. There are a number of factors to consider when you're unfurloughing. So a few practical steps that you could take. Now in a recent poll, 70% of employees said that they were nervous about returning to the workplace. So do be mindful of that and you do want to engage with and get your employees on side when you're bringing them back into the workplace. So of course, think about the environment. So we've talked about social distancing. We've talked about the potential of having minimum numbers on site. So think about how people might be able to work safely. So could they split their time between doing some working from home and some coming into the office and working in a mixed way? Could you use technology to reduce the need for face-to-face -face interaction? And what training instruction do they need? So if you're changing the working practices, what do people need to know? Think about who, how you're going to monitor and ensure that people are following the new guidelines that you've put in place. So you might want to have lots of reminders, posters up throughout the building so that people are reminded to wash their hands regularly, as an example. One of the things you might want to do is put in place some COVID-19 reps. So people in each area of the, of the um, physical environment that are monitoring and, and making sure that people are washing their hands, that they're taking breaks at separate times, that you've got a rotation, if you like, of people using the facilities. So really think about some of those things. Working hours may well need to change, so you might need to restructure the day. Uh, you will definitely need to think about avoiding hot desking. You certainly won't want people using the same facilities uh, without having any cleansing or hygiene practices in place. But you might want to agree temporary flexible working for some individuals to allow for childcare arrangements before schools return to normal. And then I think Nick touched on this, um, but this notion of employee screening and understanding whether your employees are actually fit to return. So you could temperature screen, uh, but do be, do be mindful because that could be seen as unfair treatment or harassment. So you will need to get consent from your employees if you are going to uh, put any screening in place. But you could put in place an employee declaration. So you could have some kind of questionnaire that might have questions in it, such as, have you had close contact with or cared for somebody diagnosed in the last 14 days? Or have you experienced symptoms in the last 14 days? And based on those responses, you can either allow access or not into the workplace. Now, I've seen a lot of questions uh, on Facebook and different social media platforms uh, from comments or questions from employees saying, can I refuse to return to the workplace? So I just thought it would be worth noting the following legislation that you will need to think about. So the first thing is the management of health and safety at work regulations. That places a duty on employers to assess and manage risk to their employees. 
um, an employer must assess all significant risks and we've talked about haven't we the requirement for you to do a risk, a risk assessment specifically around coronavirus. Now you could fall foul of the Employment Rights Act, um, section 44, um, employees have the right to contest the adequacy of safety arrangements without fear of recrimination. They do have the right to withdraw and refuse to return to a workplace that they feel is unsafe. Um, and they are certainly entitled to remain away from the um, workplace if they feel that they're at risk of serious and imminent danger, which uh, could not be expected to be averted. They do have the right to claim for constructive dismissal and compensation if the employer fails to maintain a safe working environment and they do have the right not to wait until they physically suffer injury before they take action to um, get suitably safe working conditions. And then finally, section 100 of the Employment Rights Act, um, any dismissal under health and safety will be deemed as automatically unfair. And to qualify for that protection, the employee must have a reasonable belief that the danger is serious and imminent. Now, um, COVID-19 would be considered as a serious or imminent risk by an employment tribunal. So you will need to think about that. And this is all about the employee and what they reasonably believe at the time. So if you fail to communicate effectively that you actually you've got some great plans and processes in place, but if they don't believe that at the time, then they're perfectly entitled to um, follow their, their legal rights. Now, if there is a claim from employment tribunal under grounds of health and safety, your employee won't need two years service. Um, and as I said, any dismissal under health and safety grounds is automatically unfair. The other piece that you will need to think about as well is the employee's right also to uh, report to authorities under whistleblowing rules and to not suffer any detriment. So you will need to think about that. So if your employee is refusing um, and they genuinely believe that it's not safe, um, some of the things you could do, firstly, is assure them through the robust risk assessment process that you've taken place by sharing that risk assessment, show them that you've taken this seriously and you've done everything you can to reduce uh, the risk to them. Listen to their concerns and show empathy. You know, this is a genuine thing for them, they're genuinely concerned. Uh, how can you assure them that it's safe? What is it that you need to do? Or what else, based on their feedback, can you put in place to allay fears that they might have? Now, if they still if they still refuse to return and you feel it's safe and they absolutely don't, then the option is your employee could take a period of unpaid leave, or they could uh, you could agree that they would take some annual leave. Now, of course, employers might say right now, well, could I discipline my employee for refusing? Um, I think right now any disciplinary action might be seen as in, inappropriate and it certainly could be quite risky for you, especially if you've not explored all of the avenues that I've already talked about. So I think disciplinary should be avoided if possible. But ending on a positive, you know, look for the opportunity to engage and support. If you're doing this properly and effectively as an employer, it's going to pay dividends because you're going to have highly engaged employees who are going to come back to the workplace and be incredibly productive. That's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Martin. Thanks, Kate. Um, morning. Uh, my name's Martin John. I'm currently working in the food manufacturing industry, uh, which is a sector that has remained in full production throughout the pandemic. I'm going to share some learnings and best practice from my industry. So the first thing is about getting started. Uh, obviously, Nick mentioned the risk assessment and this cannot be done from behind a desk. You need to get out onto the site, into the production area. You need to start talking to your staff, getting them involved and listening to some of the ideas um, because the chances are that they will come up with some very good practical solutions to uh, the problems that you encounter. As Nick said, make sure that you've documented the process. It can be then used as a reference point by your managers, your team leaders, if they have any particular problems. Brief and train all of your staff, and that should also include agency workers if you're using them. Uh, and the other thing is signage. It reinforces the message. And again, if you've got uh, different nationalities on site, think about multi-language signage that uh, may be appropriate in certain areas. So first thing to think about is getting to the workplace. Um, Travelling to work, 
car sharing in some cases can be a real positive because it avoids the use of public transport. But on the other hand, if you've got people car sharing from different households, how are you going to promote social distancing? So you need to think about that and what you're going to ask your employees to do. Agency staff, if you're using large numbers of agency staff, the chances are that they're coming on site by coach or by minibus, in which case the agency provider should have done assessments and you need to be uh, able to see those documented assessments and it's worth checking and auditing that the, the uh, actions are in place. Signing in, well, this is quite interesting. Um, review your current process, where are you doing it? Again, coming back to, uh, to Nick's point, if you can do it outside, great, rather than having to bring people into the building. Pens, this is a, a bugbear of mine. You go into a reception and there's a pen there that every single visitor is using to sign in with. If that is the case, make sure that there's hand sanitizer provided and it needs to be next to the pens and there needs to be a clear instruction telling people to use it. If you're using a fingerprint system for clocking in, that's another area to reconsider because uh, again, there's potential cross-contamination with people touching the system. So modify your systems according to the risk. And interestingly, at one business I was at, they had done a fantastic job in terms of separating the agency staff on the signing in and signing out process. However, the agency guys then had to wait for the minibus in a dedicated area, which was so small that they were packed shoulder to shoulder and you lost all the benefits of social distancing. Changing rooms we've spoken about earlier, one thing to think about is if you provide lockers is the spacing between the lockers and also if you've got a multi-shift environment can you make sure that people on the same shifts are as far apart as possible when you allocate the lockers shift patterns if you can stagger the start times brilliant uh, the other thing to consider is increasing the number of shifts you're working so let's say for example you're just working a day shift at the moment is there a possibility that you can move to having a day and an afternoon shift and that reduces the number of people that you've got on site at any one time? Okay, now entering the factory, we spoke about staggered start times. Obviously, the factory entrance tends to be a big bottleneck. You need to consider hand washing and have you got enough wash stations? And also, have you got enough uh, uh, hand sanitizers? Do you need to put more hand sanitizers there? And also the cleaning and the service of that area, making sure that if you're using hand towels, that they're regularly, the bins are regularly emptied. PPE, obviously, ideally, you want to have dedicated wherever possible, and you want to have individual storage locations. What do I mean by that? Again, I've been into businesses where at the start of the shift, everyone gets a nice clean white coat that they put on. They then go to break, hang their coat up on any old hook, when they come back after break, it's a free for all and people just grab any coat they can. If you have clear numbered, dedicated hooks for individuals then they can use the same PPE throughout the shift. If you're gonna have to have shared PPE, often say for agency workers in the food industry, you've got things like uh, Wellington boots that are shared. Make sure that there's a, a clear cleaning regime that when one person finishes using them for the day, they're thoroughly cleaned and sanitized before another person has to use them. And breaks, stagger them wherever possible. As an example, if you've got four production lines with 10 people on each, rather than sending 40 people to break at once, why not send one line at a time, 10 people at a time? In the canteen, have you got enough tables to make sure that uh, you can enable social distancing? Again, what I've seen is people bring on site temporary porter cabin facilities, that increases the number of tables that you've got for individuals and keeps people apart. Vending machines, another potential problem, people fumbling for change, queues. Um, why not try and put tea and coffee on free vend? Uh, it's, a, it's a good morale booster. And again, it reduces the amount of contact uh, with the machine surfaces. And smoking areas, an area that does tend to be forgotten about they tend to be fairly small areas. Is there enough space to accommodate the number of smokers that you have on shift at any one time? Okay, the production process. Uh, again, 
where possible, can you move to individual cells rather than production lines? And what do I mean by that? Well, a good example, I've seen a, a small production line with five people on it. Uh, two individuals were making up boxes, passing them to a third person who was then putting a raw material into the box. They then passed it to a fourth person who uh, sealed the box and applied the label. They then passed it to a fifth person who put it into a tray, covered up the tray and applied another label. Those five individuals were literally working shoulder to shoulder. So there was no two meter roll rule there. By taking that and splitting it down into five individual operations, so each operator has their own workstation and uh, they do the whole task in terms of make boxes, uh, et cetera. You can get two meters between each of them and you get your social distancing. If you can't move to cellular manufacturing, then one you should start to look at other things. An example, wherever possible, operators should work back to back rather than facing each other. If you can't do that, clear perspex type screens between operators above head height, again, so you're uh, eliminating the, the possibility of, uh, of contact and regularly clean those screens. So they need to be on your cleaning schedule. And again, last sort of worst case scenario, if you've got to go to PPE, then consider the visors or face mask. From personal experience, I find that visors are more comfortable uh, and uh, particularly if you're asking people to wear them for a long period of time, they probably make more sense to use. And disposable gloves. In the food industry, it's common for people to have a choice as to whether they want to wear gloves or not. I think you've now got to make it mandatory. It's got to be part and parcel of the process. Any shared equipment that you've got, I'm thinking about things like toolboxes, for example, uh, making sure that they are regularly cleaned and you have some clear re uh, cleaning regimes in place. And hand sanitizers, typically at the moment, hand sanitizers are placed at the entrance to a factory where people are washing their hands. You now need to be stationing hand sanitizers on every production line and at every process. And then onto your cleaning and sanitizing. You need to review your current procedures and also you need to review the cleaning materials that you're using to see if they're effective enough. A lot of uh, tackling COVID-19 is about sanitation. Um, so it's getting the right sanitizers in site, uh, on site. And you should be able to speak to your um, uh, providers and they should be able to recommend which are the right materials to use. You're probably gonna need to increase the frequency of your clean downs as well check and audit the compliance of your, your operators, making sure that they are cleaning things properly according to your new procedures. Have some special uh, cleaning procedures in place at shift handovers. Uh, so any equipment that's potentially shared from one shift to the next is thoroughly sanitized between shifts. Mention extra hand washing stations, extra hand sanitizers wherever possible. And then cleaning of non-production areas. Uh, don't forget the canteen, so regularly cleaning of the tables. Don't forget your smoking area as well. That's an area that tends to get forgotten about. Uh, and also offices and receptions, so that they should be on your cleaning schedules. And finally, the review process. Um, you need to have a regular review of your procedures. And again, it's a go see, it's a get out there, it's talking to people and understanding what's working well and what isn't. Don't forget that any new starters that you've got that are coming into the business, both permanent and agency staff need to go through the training before they come on site. And give positive feedback to your employees when they're complying with the new procedures. In a lot of cases, the procedures that you may have put in place may have made the job slightly more difficult. So if people are following those rules, lots of positive feedback for them. Okay, Rich, back to you for question and answers. Taking myself off mute. Right, great. Thank you very much, everybody. I've had a few questions come in. A um, uh, question for Nick. Uh, can you please run us through the riddle process and how it actually works? What does an employer actually have to do? Yeah, so the it's very, Google's our friend on this one. So the HSE site is really clear on it. If you were to Google uh, how to report a riddle, it'll, the first thing up there will be the HSE site. Unless it's a fatality or a, a serious injury or a serious dangerous occurrence, 
it's an online form and there's one for a different um each different aspect of a riddle so if it was a, an injury a dangerous occurrence or a disease in this case uh so but don't rush into it make sure you've investigated it properly and then the guidance there is really strong you should have a competent health and safety advisor available to your business and check with them that you're doing it properly. Um, then there was a uh, sort of a question slash statement about people wearing gloves and then eating their sandwiches with their gloves on. I think you've also seen this, um, to be honest, in places like supermarkets where people use gloves uh, to pick up all these things and then you see them using their gloves everywhere else and you're just thinking they're, they're not understanding how they use gloves properly. So. This is probably an industry, well, it's not an industry, it's probably a worldwide training thing. If you're going to use gloves, use them properly. But how do you address these things? Um, from my perspective, in the food industry, it would definitely be a no-no. Um, and disposable gloves are very cheap at the moment. So uh, to have people using them when in the workplace and then should be part and parcel. Once you come out, if you're going to break or whatever, the, the gloves are thrown away. You wash your hands, you sanitize your hands, and you go off the break, and then you get a new set of gloves when you go back into the workplace. Okay. I've, seen, I've seen on sites where the, they've actually got um, a bin arrangement. So at the sanitation point, there is a clearly signposted, put your gloves in the bin um, sign, and just that just helps reinforce the behavior. Just a matter of interest, normally how I've seen gloves, they've always been in boxes that seem to be that when you touch and you pull a pair of gloves through, it's also possible to leave your residue actually on the boxes themselves. So there are some issues around that that need to be overcome clearly. Um, Martin, another question for you. Uh, you talk about machinery and, you know, and how you could have people sitting back to back, but I also know examples, for example, in the potato industry where a lot of their machinery is set up, say, a metre apart. Uh, and there is no ability to do that. What's the, what's the solution there? What can you do? I think in that particular case, you've got to look at screens, if possible, between people. And mm -hmm. I know if you look at some of the uh, the big mo uh, food manufacturing companies, people who are doing things like uh, sandwich manufacture, where you've got lots of people on a production line, uh, these sort of clear perspex screens have started to be used between individuals. Otherwise, it's going to have to be a case of uh, some kind of face covering. Uh, just said visors, ideally, if not masks. The, the thing with masks, and I, I've been into food factories where I've had to wear a mask for uh, a, a long period of time, and particularly in a colder environment, is they're quite uncomfortable and it's quite difficult to breathe uh, with some yep. of these masks. So I think your visor is the, is the better bet. Uh, but yeah, it's a fact of life in the food industry that you know, people do tend to have to stand close together um, and it's very difficult to distance them. Yeah, was, yeah, was, yeah go on, sorry. sorry mate. The, the other aspect of that is not switching out the teams. So if you, if you used to mix the teams up, try and keep the same people together. If they have to be working closely together, keep the same people working together time after time. Don't split them and mix them up. Okay. Which, is, which is a, is a, is a challenge because it's against the, what tends to happen at the moment, which is this whole thing about job rotation and wanting to move people onto different roles because of manual handling type issues. So that's a clear case if you want to change your standard practice or what has been your standard practice to a, to a different procedure. You also find within a, a manufacturing environment that because of the nature of, I don't know if it's the nature of the people, but because of people involved, they, they tend to spend a lot more time in close proximity to people. They, you know, they, they might be tribal focused to a certain degree that they actually naturally just draw themselves together anyway. And there's very little you can actually do about it. Yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. You've almost got to, I think it comes back down to uh, one of the things that Kate mentioned was sort of having a, a COVID expert, you have got to have a little bit of the COVID police in your manufacturing environment. So I think it's your supervisors, your team leaders, it's training those individuals so that they are constantly reinforcing the message to people that you don't have to put your arm around each other when you're having a chat. Uh, and the other thing is culturally, certainly a lot of um, Eastern Europeans that you work with in the food industry, shaking hands is part and parcel of every day um, as soon as you come in at the start of the shift yep. you shake your, shake your uh, colleague's hand and you shake their hand at the end of the shift so that's quite difficult for them to overcome that sort of a uh, you know cultural issues that they've had okay um and another point uh, kate actually which you didn't mention which i was 
actually thought about, which was uh, holidays. Um, because this is obviously, you know, we've got people being furloughed, unfurloughed. Uh, we've got people building up holiday entitlement, whether they're furloughed or unfurloughed. I think that's still the case. Um, so, um, you know, how do you build that into your um, requirements? Because I think we're all starting to see now this is building up, you know, nobody's seeing actually reality kick in here that we might come to a point where you get to the end of the year and people haven't used a holiday up because they've been furloughed or unfurloughed or whatever. How are we going to address that particular issue? Well, of course, the government has now addressed that. Initially, they, were, they weren't very clear about how employers should uh, address the issue of holiday. Um, employees will still be accruing holiday while they're furloughed. You're absolutely uh, right. Um, and we do now have guidance from the government that says employers can ask their employees to take holiday whilst they are furloughed, providing they give double the amount of notice of the holiday period. Um, they will have to make up. So if the uh, government, if the employee, uh, sorry, if the employer is just paying at 80%, um, when they are uh, taking holiday, they will need to make that up to 100%, certainly for statutory holidays. So for the 5.6 weeks per annum, the statutory holiday will need to be made up to 100%. Anything beyond that, then it's up to the employer. And of course, we do now know, don't we, that uh, holiday can be carried over for uh, a two-year period. So there is an op there is an option here for uh, employers to be flexible and think about how they use holidays. Yeah, I think the issue of um, having the holiday spread over two years will potentially help the issue, potentially creates a much bigger issue just as an employer. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> the other thing uh, you mentioned was about having a furlough um, um, arrangement. Sorry, you referred to having a furlough agreement in place with staff. As far as I'm aware, there is no such thing as a further agreement with most HR contracts that existed. Um, and it was a new term that was brought in by the government. So what is this further agreement and how do you have one? OK, so when an employer would have agreed with their employee that they would be furloughed, there would have been or should have been a written agreement. It didn't yeah. need to be signed by the employee. And there was a bit of uh, there was a bit of clarification required on that initially. Um, but there would be a written document between the employer and employee to confirm and officially redesignate them as a furloughed employee. And it would have stated what they can and can't do during the period of furlough. That document and that, that fundamentally changes the employment terms and conditions on a temporary basis. So in order to bring them back into the workplace, they will need to unfurlough them formally and now confirm in writing that the period of furlough has come to an end. But of course, then restate what those new terms are. So for many employers, they will use it as an opportunity to uh, get the employee to agree to new terms and conditions uh, that include the right to lay off or put on short time working, which mm -hmm. for many industries outside of the manufacturing industry wouldn't normally be the case in a contract of employment. And it's obviously entirely up to the employee whether it, they accept those terms. Sure. Because you the other thing you also mentioned is having a coronavirus um, policy in place as well, which is another new introduced policy, which um, do you need to consult with staff on that? Is that just something you can issue as a just a fact? Yeah, it's, I, I would say you don't need to consult. Fundamentally, you know, if you're an employer with 15 policies across your workplace, but you might have a policy on smoking, on how to take breaks, on booking holiday, booking absence. And obviously, at the moment, you will need to override all of those policies. So rather than having to individually go through and adapt each one, you would just have one coronavirus policy that covers all policies saying in the interim, these are the new arrangements. And you would simply uh, let your employees know that this would be the new temporary arrangement. I'm also very conscious that you know a lot of our talk was sort of implying much larger um, operations and organisations, but there's you know a lot of people listening to this will actually be smaller organisations. You know, some will maybe have less than five employees, uh, in which case the whole question around health and safety and health and safety policies is a whole different other issue. Uh, and those might and there might be others who have maybe only say ten employees in their offices uh, and in much smaller offices, and they don't have the luxury of some of the things you've talked about. How can we address some of those issues for them? from a practical standpoint, it's really Nick and Martin, I'm guessing, but maybe a bit of Kate as well on that. Nick, you're on mute. Sorry, they, um, they don't necessarily need to document the same extent, but they need to consider everything we thought around mm -hmm. and communicate. Um, so do keep records of the communication, 
but the the emphasis on the risk assessment is more to do it and think it through and less about um actually physically publishing it and, and communicating it but all the same issues apply yeah. so they they do need to think it through okay martin um, go. okay go Oh, go on then. I was just going to say from, from my point of view, I, yeah, I have every empathy with a small employer because there is a huge amount when you just look at this one um, presentation, there's a huge amount for them to take on board and they clearly can't be an expert in everything. So, I, you know, I would just push and say, look, this is a fantastic service that's been laid on by the by the authority. Um, they can have a one to one session for 60 minutes, which will look at their own business and look at the things that they can put in place. So I would strongly recommend that they take advantage of that to get the appropriate level of advice that they that they need. And it might sound very daunting, but I think by having a simple plan in place and a few simple documents, actually they can be very effective in what they're doing. Okay. And is there, uh, is there any sort of minimum period, you know, when we talk about furthering unfurthering staff, is there any sort of minimum period you have to give notice in terms of um, bringing them back on or put them on further? No. Uh, so um, it will be whatever you put in that furlough agreement. So if you'd said, you know, you need to be available to come back immediately, um, but you may you may have said we'll give you a week's notice. So it does depend on what was agreed at the time with the employee. Um, but the whole idea of the furlough scheme is that you can be quite reactive. It was designed on the basis that, you know, businesses hit a brick wall and they had to respond immediately. So, no, there is there's an immediacy to it. But like I say, you need to be fair with your employees and give them a bit of notice that they've, they've got arrangements they've got to make but also they've got to get their head around the change yeah i think there's some really good advice coming through in this um, webinar today i think there's a huge amount to ta take on board martin sorry any last comments from you i, I think the key is about engagement uh, mm -hmm. i think if you get your employees involved uh, particularly where you're putting in new procedures you're changing things if they seem to have an input into the new procedures, they'll make them work. Uh, it's a lot yeah. easier if it's their ideas rather than having to keep imposing things on people. Sure. Okay. Kate, any last comments from you? No, I think I, I think I agree. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for employers to uh, really engage with their employees and uh, you know build a really strong reputation. Good. And uh, Nick, anything from you? Yeah, just just to build on that from the the consultation piece to add on that the monitoring and the checking that everything is working so uh, don't take it that you can just do a one-off exercise and everything is good so keep consulting and keep checking that things are working actually i have got um a question here about um government funding so is there any government funding available to help with all the extra costs the business will have in putting these safety measures in place so I'm not aware of any. The only things you could consider is uh, if you're doing anything really innovative, there may be some R&D angle on it. Or if it was something that you could roll out to other businesses, then there could be some COVID related grant. But I'm not aware of anything specifically for back to work unless anyone else is. I think well, if you're a small business, I mean, obviously you've got C bills or you've got obviously the, the bounce back loan, which would be ideal the, you know, by, by its nature and the name. It's about you getting back. Yeah, I think the trouble with a lot of these loans is people are looking at immediacy of cash and they haven't probably started thinking about the idea of returning to work. And that's why what we're doing now is quite valuable in terms of their planning. But a lot of people have been planning for returning to work, but haven't even thought about all these measures they're going to have to put in place yet. So, um, and from my experience of the businesses I've seen applying for uh, bounce back loans, it's almost a case of throwing a number against a wall and just seeing if they can get the application and get the money out rather than actually planning anything further than that. So it does appear to be there's quite a bit more work needed in that regard. Uh, and again, as regards grants, um, there's no grants that I'm aware of available at local government level. Um, there is the potential, as uh, Nick has alluded to, to get something from the likes of Innovate UK around COVID changing technologies, um, but that's more developing a solution that you could sell to other companies and then the resulting R&D tax credits that you might get from it. But uh, at the moment in time, I'm not aware of any type of funding. Um, any other questions at all? Otherwise, we look like we're perfectly finishing at 12 o'clock, which is great. 
Okay, so um, in terms of um, other things to mention, uh, as I said, we do have another webinar next week, which is on operating efficiency and how to uh, increase and maximize your profits in this ever-changing world. Um, so you can book on to uh, those seminars at uh, the Signpost to Growth website, as well as the CPCA business support.co.uk website. And to get in touch to book a one-to-one -one session, either email support at cpcabusinesssupport.co.uk or go to the CPCA Business Support website um, and fill in the form online. Um, without any further ado, just like to thank all our speakers today. It was a fascinating talk, um, a bit more uplifting than I thought it was going to be, to be perfectly honest. It's a, it's a, it's a tough subject and, um, you know, there's a lot of changes ahead. So just like to thank you all. And if there's uh, any questions, please feel free to email us after the event. So thanks very much to everybody and uh, thank you for attending. Thank you.